Welcome, everybody. I'm Kyle Hines, and I'll be hosting the Players Podcast, a GTM family production in partnership with the EuroLeague Players Association. I will be having in-depth conversations with current and former EuroLeague players about important topics that many athletes face on and off the basketball court. Stay tuned for more episodes. Welcome, everybody, to another edition, a very special episode today of the Players Podcast presented to you by the EuroLeague Players Association. Today, we have a very special guest, um, you know, one of the you know, most well-traveled and successful um, basketball players um, that has played the last number of years um, and is now has done um, amazing things off the court. Um, my guy, fellow Gate 7 alumni, Josh Childress. Josh, how's everything? All is well, Kyle. How you doing, brother? I'm doing well, man. I can't can't complain. Um, before we start, I'd like to um, start off by listing, listing, you know, some of your accolades and, you know, kind of getting into your resume a little bit for for the fans and for the viewers that uh, that don't know you. Um, first of all, you were the, the sixth pick of the NBA draft in 2004. Um, you've had a long career, you know, playing with the Atlanta Hawks, with the Olympiacos, as we mentioned, the Phoenix Suns, the Brooklyn Nets, the New Orleans Pelicans, the Sydney Kings, which we're going to talk about a little bit later because we have something in common there. Um, the Texas Legends, two years in Japan, and another year um, in Australia. And your individual accomplishments are, I mean, are incredible as well. Um, First of all, you were a Parade All-American in in high school, Um, a Stanford graduate, which may be the most impressive thing, you know, on your resume. (laughs) Um, First team, all Pac-10, all rookie team, um, all EuroLeague team, numerous, you know, Greek League accomplishments. MB, MBL first team, um, and now, um, which is something that we're going to get into today, um, as you can see the logo in the background, you're the CEO of Landspire Group, um, and amongst other things, amongst other things that you have done in your career, your career, both on and off the basketball court, man, I just want to say I appreciate you taking the time um, for stepping in and, and being a part of the Players Podcast today. Yeah, no, I appreciate you having me. Um, obviously, uh, accolades aside, man, it's it's uh, it's been a, a heck of a journey. I've been very blessed, uh, you know, and and you know, growing up where you know I grew up was probably similar to the city to where you grew up. Mm-hmm. It's not easy to to get out and to to do what we've done. So, um, you know, just want to make sure that we always appreciate that and, and uh, you know make light of that. So it's been a blessing for sure. Definitely, definitely. Now we're on, we're going to fast forward right into your Euroleague career. Um, and you were kind of, you know, um, I guess you would say a pioneer um, of some sorts. Um, I kind of put you in a group of you, Earl Boykins, um, you know, those guys that were, you know, at the time, um, you know, before you kind of came along and decided to go overseas, you know, overseas was almost looked at, looked as, you know, a lot of guys where their careers were over. You know, you have guys like, you know, I guess you could say Dominique Wilkins and, you know, um, Roy Tarpley and some other guys, you know, that, you know, once their careers were over, you know, they went, you know, overseas, but you were kind of a pioneer, whereas that, you know, in the mix of your prime that you decided to, you know, take your career um, overseas and, and, and play for Olympiaco. So, you know, talk about what went into that decision and what went into that process um, um, for you. Yeah, man, the decision uh, really, was based on the, the restricted free agent process in the NBA mm-hmm. and essentially finding a way to sidestep that. Uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, I spent four years in Atlanta, was uh, what I thought was part of the core of that team. And, you know, a new GM comes in and tells me to go out and test the market. And, and I did. You know, I had a couple other teams that I was looking at that he didn't necessarily want to do any signing trades with. And so it just created a situation where, um, you know, this Olympiacos deal uh, was pitched to a number of other guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I sat down with them, understood their vision, uh, got a chance to, to, to go to Athens, um, see the facilities, see, you know, Athens in the summer. And, um, you know, the decision was easy after that. So I was able to not only, um, you know, get a contract that was, um, was, was nice and was quality for me and my family, but also an opportunity to, you know, step out of this restricted free agent process and, um, you know, still play the ball, play ball at a high level. Now, what were your initial thoughts? Like you said, you, you talked to 
um, you know, the, the owners of Olympiacos at the time. And, and then when you went to Greece that very first time, um, you know, Athens is a lot different than, you know, Compton, California or, or, or Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so what were your initial thoughts when you stepped on the plane, off the plane that first time for that first visit? Man, it was, uh, it was incredible. And, mm-hmm. and mainly because, you know, there was a fair amount of, of attention there, you know, that I didn't realize that Olympiacos had. You know, mm-hmm. you, you think about European basketball uh, and, you know, you see, well, I, I, I'd only seen really uh, soccer to that point. See the fans, they're, they're hype, they're in the, in the stadium going crazy. Uh, and I never really experienced that. I mean, Stanford is a pretty small um, university. Uh, you know, our, our fans in Atlanta, we didn't necessarily sell out every game, let's mm-hmm. say that. Uh, so, you know, having that sort of passionate kind of rabid fan was new. Um, so for me, it was like, uh, just it was cool. It was fun. It was, you know, a, a new thing that I hadn't experienced before. And, and um, you know, that kind of in combination, like I said, with, you know, being in Athens in the summer uh, and uh, just seeing the lifestyle and, uh, you know, how, how guys enjoyed living there. I spoke with an, a, a few guys as well. It's just, it, it made the decision a little bit easier for me. Yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, I, like I said, we're, we're both Olymp- Olympiacos alumni, I guess you can say. And, you know, yeah. there's nothing better than Greece or Athens in, in the summertime. Um, sure, it's, it's, it's amazing. Where did you, uh, where'd you stay at when you, when you lived there? I was in Kifada. Yeah, same with me. Same with me. And there's there, there's yeah. and there's nothing better than Gufada, Gufada or Vula or Vulimente in the summertime. <laughs> For sure, man. For sure. Now, when you what did you know about Euroleague basketball before you came over? Because um, I mean, honestly, for me, like I I didn't know anything about overseas basketball um, at all growing up. You know, as you know, American kids, you know, our first dream is you know the NBA, and that's it. And, you know, overseas basketball is kind of an afterthought. But, you know, what did you know about EuroLeague before you before you came? Did you know anything? Did you watch any games? Did you have any, um, you know, did you know anything about it? Yeah, I didn't know anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, I knew that, you know, a couple of my friends played over there. So, I, you know, I reached out to those guys and asked some questions. Um, you know, and obviously you see, you know, your high-level guys from Europe come over to the league and some have success, some don't. Uh, but... You know, I was going into into that league, you know, really unaware of of what it was going to look like. I'd watch some stuff on YouTube and, you know, tried to do as much uh, due diligence as I could. But, you know, you never really know until you get in it uh, and you understand, you know, how how uh, high level the basketball is in, in Europe, in Europe oh, specifically. On the court, what was the biggest adjustment compared to the, to the NBA for you? Uh, I think it was... Um, you know, the, the strategy behind the games, behind mm-hmm. the games, uh, you know, we, we had a heck of a team yeah. uh, that you know, we still, I think, tried to, to strategize a bit more than other teams or, you know, I don't say we overdid it, but, you know, you got a team full of, of horses, you got to let the horses go out and roll, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, that was a change because in the league, you just, you let your, your guys just get after it. And, you know, it was very much, uh, you know, based on like strategic plays and, and, you know, making sure that you follow the game plan, which I understand. Uh, but, you know, that was a big adjustment period for me, um, you know, in coming over there. We talk about the adjustment on the court, but what about the adjustment off the court? Um, I was listening to an interview you were doing a little bit earlier and you were talking about how, um, you know, once you got to Athens, you said it was difficult, but, um, I want you to explain a little bit about, you know, your mentality once you got there. You, you, you talked about in the interview how, you know, you kind of went with almost like an open mind, a mindfulness about going over there um, because you, were, you said that, you know, as, you know, as a young kid that you can never fathom, you know, having the opportunity to, you know, to be in, in Athens, Greece. So talk about that mentality and talk about where that kind of stemmed from for, for you. Yeah, so. Uh, you know, once again, never in my wildest dreams imagined playing basketball in Europe, mm-hmm. um, you know, and at that level. And so when I came over, um, you know, having spent three years at Stanford, I was exposed to a wide range of people, uh, you know, from a bunch of different backgrounds. So I'd, I'd been able to, you know, find my way in that world, uh, you know, quite comfortably. And, you know, I, I was going to do the same when I came to, to Athens. And so um, you know, I spent a fair amount of time, you know, in my first kind of few weeks there, a few months there, 
just learning the, the culture, you know, figuring out where to go, where not to go, mm-hmm. um, you know, who you talk to, who you don't talk to, kind of all those things that you you do when you you move to a new place. Um, and uh, you know, eventually, I realized that you know I I didn't like the attention like that. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and, and you know, you're, you're walking down the street or you're at the grocery store, and somebody just wants to show you their their Panathinaikos tattoo or the Olympiakos yeah. tattoo, or whatever, you know, and it's just like just a constant barrage of, of this. And, you know, there comes a time where, you know, you're in it so much that you just need a break. Exactly. And so yeah, towards the second half of my, my first year there, um, you know, I, I, I spent a lot more time in the house in my second year, the same, just because it was, uh, it got overwhelming sometimes. Now you were the the highest. You mentioned the contract, but you were the highest paid, you know, player outside of the NBA. Um, and you know, you got a lot of attention because of that. You know, there was a lot of, you know, whether or not it was, you know, articles from the American press or articles from the the foreign press. Did you ever feel like any added pressure be, because of that? Because you know, the weight of your your contract and the expectations that that kind of came with that. Of course, mm-hmm. of course. I mean, I was that weighed heavily on me, especially my first year. Um, you know, coming over to Europe, having that adjustment period, uh, and, uh, you know, coming in there feeling like I needed to, you know, put up 20 and 10, yeah. you know, and have a coach that said, I want you to be a part of the system. And so I'm, I'm balancing that in my mind. Uh, and, you know, I've always prided myself on being a very coachable player. And, and so, you know, from the outside looking in, you know, people probably would question, you know, my effectiveness, my numbers, all that stuff. And for me, it was just a juggling act where I was trying to, um, you know, live up to, to the contract while also trying to, to fit into a system that, you know, the coach wanted to, to, to create. So, um, you know, it's definitely, you know, definitely pressure there. Um, you know, I, I dealt with it the best I could. I ended up that first year, I, I lost my, my father as well. So I was dealing with some personal things, um, you know, that kind of impacted me on the court. But uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a different kind of beast when you got that pressure and people are expecting you to do X, Y, Z because of, you know, the, the contract that you have. And I think that's a, that's a, a unique quality that, that athletes are unique situation that athletes have to deal with. Right. Mm-hmm. People know what you know, mm-hmm. right. And, and they always measure you based on, on that metric. Um, and it just creates a dynamic where, you know, your value isn't necessarily always tied to your contracts because your value to that team is based on what you bring to that team, not necessarily, you know, the, the amount of points and rebounds and assists that you, you, you know, you can put up on the floor. So um, definitely felt pressure, but you know, it's, it's a part of the game. Yeah. My, I think the, the positive of that, um, you know, for a player like me was that, um, you know, my first exposure of overseas life was seeing you, um, you know, because you went over and because, you know, you had garnered so much attention, you know, whether or not it was in, you know, Slam Magazine or, you know, the features they did on you on ESPN or different things like that. You know, I, my view of overseas basketball was, you know, seeing it through your perspective. And I think it it was more comforting for me when I went to come overseas because I seen I was like, wow, I was like, you know, even though I didn't know you, but I was like, you know, Josh Childress is able to do this. He's able to, you know, live this, you know, you know, this, this life um, in Athens, Greece, um, you know, and I think it helped make my adjustment a lot easier knowing, you know, it made it more comfortable for me. So th- th- do any other guys, you know, you know, come to you and say that and a lot of any other young guys ever come to you and, and, and talk to you about that? Yeah. And, and I'd say guys talk to me more about, um, just opening their eyes to mm-hmm. to opportunities in Greece, you yeah. know, or in Europe in, in general. Europe in general. Uh, and, you know, feeling comfortable and confident in being able to make a living for themselves, you know, providing for their families and not always feeling the need to chase the NBA dream. Yeah, exactly. uh, The NBA obviously is the NBA, right? And it's, it's the pinnacle of professional basketball. Uh, but, um, you know, guys do very well for themselves over in Europe and, um, you know, are able to create long, successful careers, uh, you know, in doing so. And so I've had a few a few guys come to me and, and really just mention that they were thankful that I showed them that, um, you know, that was a possibility and, you know, they didn't have to chase the NBA, uh, you know, at length and end up, 
you know, in the process, you know, missing out on a, a fair amount of, of dollars for themselves and their family. Yeah, man, I, I, I want to say, I want to thank you. And I appreciate you. Cause like you said, I mean, you, you definitely, you were the, you know, the pioneer, I guess sometimes the, you know, pioneer has to take the the shots on the, you know, on the front line sometimes, but you definitely show that there's definitely, you know, life outside of, you know, the NBA and you can still be, you know, successful and still, you know, um, like you said, take care of your family and still, you know, be afforded, you know, many other opportunities that many people thought were only existed inside the NBA. So, yeah, I, just no, I appreciate that, that bro. Appreciate now, I have to ask this question. And, you know, um, one of the things that, you know, being a, you know, on the Olympiacos and, and understanding the Panathinaikos rivalry, um, everybody I've talked to has a story, um, Olympiacos or Panathinaikos story. Um, so first, how do you describe the Olympiacos Panthenicos rivalry to people that don't that have never been a part of it. And then the <laughs> second part of the question is, you know, do you have a story? Because you played in some heated games. I mean, there was there was, you know, times where I think at the time there they were the I guess the 10, they won eight eight championships in a row in the Greek league or something like that. And they were defending Euro League champions one of the years before or something like that. So you guys are considered the two best teams, you know, probably in Euro League and in one city. So I know you guys had a lot of different rivalries. So, you know, what what is your you know, your best, you know, moment or best memory from, you know, from those games? Yes. Yeah, so I would, I mean, not everybody gets this reference, but I would describe this, that rivalry as like, the bloods and the crips on steroids. That's, that's how it's I just, say it. That's how I say it. That's how I say it. You know, yeah. it's like on site, they just yeah. they just get nasty. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, and you know, it's a long heated rivalry. You're born into, you know, being an Olympiacos or Panathinaikos fan, and you know, like I, I mentioned, the tattoos and you know, people. It's 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 a it's life. It's a lifestyle for them, and so um, you know that and the passion that it breeds is. It's, it's just crazy to experience. And, you know, I say my first exposure to it and my last exposure, two stories I'll tell. So um, first exposure, we have our first uh, away game at Waka. And, um, you know, coach comes to me and says, hey, Josh, you haven't experienced this before. I'm not going to start you tonight. I want you to just take this in, understand what this is going to be like. Um, you know, so I'm like, all right, I've played in crazy places. Like, why, why are you acting like this? Uh, and we walk, we, we walk in, we go through uh, layup lines, and all of a sudden I look over, and uh, they're like fanning this area right by our bench. And I'm like, what's what's going on, dude? And so I, I saw the net, you know, that protects us, yeah. was on fire. And so somebody <laughs> shot a flare down at our bench and the, and shot it, and it landed in the towel bag, and the towel bag caught on fire. And it's just like... <laughs> This is the start of, you know, of the game. And so I, I'm just like, all right, what, what the heck did I get myself into? And then fast forward to, you know, my last game in, in Greece, uh, it was at um, at Seth. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was it was in the playoffs. And we would go out to warm up and everybody's like coughing. And I'm like coughing, eyes water. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? So they usher us back into the locker room. And we asked him what's happening. And the police had to shoot tear gas in the gym because <laughs> our fans were going crazy, right? So had to let it air out, you know, had to go back out, warm up again. Uh, and um, we played a game, game's not going well. Uh, and so um, to start to see stuff flying from the, from the stands. Uh, and my, I have a couple of my buddies there that, that game. And, uh, you know, I look over and they're just like, dude, this is crazy. So the fans had gone into the bathrooms. They'd broken down the toilets. They were throwing like pieces of ceramic. They were throwing toilet handles, stuff from the faucets, sinks. Um, you know, my buddy uh, got hit with a bottle that was filled with uh, urine and feces. Uh, and it's just, it was just a crazy thing. So then um, somebody throws something on kind of near, near Pantelakos' bench. And um, one of the things I'll never forget, your time hopper in told me, he said, Josh, whatever you do, if anything touches the floor, never, never touch it. Never yeah. go grab it, never kick. He's like, he's telling me the story of somebody that uh, got two of their fingers blown off going to pick up something off the floor. And yeah, sure enough, this was like an M80 or some sort of like firecracker or something that they threw on the, on the floor and made a, a black mark on, the, on our, our floor. So 
it's it's wild, man. It's wild. You know, you obviously you've been in some of the other places with, uh, you know, like uh, Serbia. They, they mm-hmm. got the laser pointers or rolls of receipt paper. They were throwing hot coins at you, batteries, whatever. So it's it's a jungle out there, man. Yeah, man. I think like like I said, I think some of the people you tell tell this to and tell these stories to that that don't understand it or don't experience or I try to tell it to my friends, you know, back home. And I'm sure you've done the same that they, they don't get it. Like, and it's hard to really, unless you experienced it, like it's hard to really put in words. Like for my, my experience, like we were playing in the, the cup and at the time, I don't know how it was when you guys, but at the time when we played, the cup was the only time that both fans from either team could be there. So we were playing at the gym in, uh, in Glafada, um, at the old airport. Um, and, Olympiacos fans is on one side, Panthenagos is on fans is on one side, and I'm out there just warming up, and they're shooting flares back and forth at each other. And for whatever reason, I don't know why. I guess I was the target, or it was a misfire. Somebody shot a flare. I'm at the free throw line, you know, working on my free throws. Somebody shot a flare, hit me right in the back of my head. Boom! I fall on the ground. Ah. <laughs> my warm up pants are on fire. <laughs> they they pick me up, take me to the locker room. Right. So this is like right before the coach starts the speech. So I'm sitting there and I'm just like, you know, still a little, you know, like what's going on. So the coach just gets up and just draws the play. And, and, and I'm just looking and I'm like, yo, we're not going to mention anything about me getting hit with a flare in my head. <laughs> and, you know, how it is in Greece and some of the Greek players are like, no, this is this is just this Olympiacos Panthenegos. And <laughs> we just kept it moving like nothing even happened. Was, Man, this is... <laughs> hilarious yeah man it's uh, somebody really needs to do uh, a deep dive for like a book um about the rivalry and like different player stories because like i said everybody i've ever talked to and and i'm sure the same for you um has a story or has some type of experience about about the rivalry so for sure sure. those those stories are crazy man and just to think through just the, the deep rooted level of hate that they have for each other. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's personal. Like I, I've heard stories of like, you know, like family members, like, you know, one, one family member or a cousin is Olympiacos and somebody else is Panthenagos. And that day of the game, they don't talk to each other. Like they don't associate with each other. Like it's, it's intense, man. It's intense, man. For sure. For sure. Intense. Now I want to talk about the EuroLeague Final Four, and this is another thing that I tell a lot of people and, and my friends, and you know those, um, you know, outside of European basketball is, you know, is is an amazing event. It's something like you know no other. You know, some I guess you can kind of compare it to the NCAA Final Four, but mm-hmm. the amount of you know fanatics, you know, and the amount of fans and the environment is is unreal. And you had the opportunity to play in two of them, and, and two of the games that you played were probably with two of the, um, I guess super intense games. You know, the first one was in 2009 in Berlin with Panthenikos, the semifinal game. I think that's correct. And in 2010 yeah. was Paris with Partizan, who has another, you know, crazy fan group. So, you know, mm-hmm. for those that don't know or for those that haven't experienced the Final Four, talk about that, that Final Four experience, you know, and just the atmosphere and uh, everything about that goes along with that. Yeah, no, it's an incredible atmosphere. And uh, I would... I haven't been to an NCAA Final Four, but I would rival it to that sort of energy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the the whole city is, uh, you know, is is basketball. You know, and and everywhere you you see banners, you see, uh, you know, marketing materials. Uh, you know, it was it was incredible. I mean, I was I was just blown away at the level of professionalism mm-hmm. and you know the standard that this is at. Because once again, people don't understand. You know the the level of 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 European and Euroleague basketball, and I mean this is just it's it's, it's a class act. So um, you know going in there, uh, in the arena, seeing you know essentially four quadrants of, yeah. of teams, and you know their respective styles, how they respond to all the other fans uh, was just uh, it was unlike anything I've ever seen. Man, I was uh, I was definitely thankful for that. I mean we we ended up. First year there, we lost to to in the, the semis, um, you know, in a in a heated game, which was you know unfortunate. And then second year, um, we ended up making it to the finals and just overmatched with Barcelona. But um, I mean, it's it's uh, one of the best experiences I've ever I've ever had, you know, playing basketball. 
Talk, and I wanted you to talk about that uh, the semifinal putback, which is like you know one of the most one of the most historical plays in in uh, you know your league final four history. Now, how did you have the awareness to know that you know that I think it was Milos that shot that shot? How did you know the awareness to know that Milos like could you came from the wing of the three point line, if I'm not mistaken, to you know to catch the ball and, and tap it in? Reminds me of uh uh what play was that? Uh, the college basketball play um, was it. Villanova in Georgetown, I think, or something like that, where they, no, NC State, NC State, NC State, and uh, and they shot the ball and they had to tip in. It reminds yeah, me yeah. very similar to that. So, you know, talk about that play and just your, you know, break that down and your awareness to kind of know that um, the ball was coming off when you scored it. Yeah, I mean, the, the you know, my whole career, I was, you know, I always crashed the glass. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was, you know, I led the Pac-10 in, in rebounding as a wing. You know, I was one of the leading rebounders as a guard in the league, you know, my first few years. That's just a part of my game. I, I just hit the glass. And, um, you know, whether Milos would miss or made the shot, I was going to be in there somewhere trying mm -hmm. to just make sure, you know, I, I gave us a chance. Uh, and, yeah, it was just luck would have it. It just came right to my hands. <laughs> and I just, just you know, tip dunked that thing in. And, and um, I can't tell you, number one, obviously, it would have been a massive upset if we lost that game. Yeah. But, um, you know, just the the extra life that we gave ourselves on the bench, everybody was hyped. Pat Beverly came over there, you know, <laughs> punching me in the chest and going crazy. Um, and to this day, I'm, I'm not even going to lie, I get death threats from from uh, Farzan fans. Really? You know, oh they're, still, they're still not over it? <laughs> still not over it. I get death threats. I get, you know, F you this, that, and I hope you this, and this. I mean, it, wow. they, they still hate me over there. So, you know, for whatever reason, man, I I, uh, I made some enemies. But, uh, you know, it was definitely a, a big moment for, for the club. And, you know, I know that our, our fan base was happy that we went to the finals for the first time in a while. Definitely, definitely. Now, you've, like I said before, you've been well-traveled um, in your basketball career. Um, you've played in just about almost every continent. Um, or live in almost every continent. Now, was that a conscious choice, you know, after coming from EuroLeague and kind of experiencing, you know, what you experienced in, in Athens, you know, to go to Australia, to go to, you know, Japan, to, you know, experience these different, you know, different places. Um, and then, you know, how has that made you, um, you know, a better person, you know, being able to experience and, and what did you kind of take away from, from each one of those places that you played at? Yeah, so doing it in Greece, let me know that I could do it, mm -hmm. you know, that I could go live somewhere else and, and be comfortable, be fine, play there, you know, and, 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 and do my thing. And uh, after I got, uh, I was with the Pelicans, I ended up having my second sports hernia surgery. So then they waived me. Uh, and, you know, at that time I was just like, man, you know, I'm going to go back. I'm going to finish my degree. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is it. Right. You know, I, I was like 10 years into the time, I think, um, you know, and, and mentally I was like, all right, I, you know, 10 years, so that's a great career. Uh, you know, I'm, my body's starting to break down on me. Let me go here let me get my degree and, and kind of finish this thing out. And, um, you know, I was on campus and like, I was going to hoop and the open mm -hmm. runs with, with the Stanford players, you know, you just realize you got a little bit more left in the tank. And uh, so uh, I was still uh, getting paid by Phoenix um, so it wasn't like a financial thing for me. And mm -hmm. it was just like, all right, well, where do I want to go that I, I haven't been before? Uh, and our seasons always mismatched with Australia because I always wanted to visit there. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it was always the, I was always playing during their summer. And so I didn't want to go in the winter because that's, you know, pointless. So um, it just so happened that I got a call from my agent. He said, what do you think about Australia? You know, they were looking at some, some other guys, but, um, if you're interested. And so I took that opportunity um, also to, to then be connected with some business people in, in Sydney. And, you know, that was a part of my, my ask in going. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the salary cap there is, is nothing like EuroLeague and yeah. like the NBA. So, um, you know, it was just an opportunity for me to go out and, and invest in myself uh, by getting some, some real good time to sit with some business people, uh, you know, in a market that, you know, spoke English, had similar business, uh, you know, acumen and and uh, kind of principles to the U.S. You know, Australia is kind of the, the test market for a lot of companies that then, you know, launch here in the U.S. 
So um, that was my strategy behind it. Uh, and I loved it. I loved that time over there. Um, you know, Japan was a little different, different story, but um, <laughs> Australia was, was more about, uh, you know, just going over and, and learning and, and living in a country that I'd wanted to visit. Now, for those that don't know, um, you were able to, you know, like you said, you, you spoke with and, and met with and a lot of business people over in Australia. And now it, it gave you the opportunity to become an owner um, of a team. Um, so, which is something that we now have in common. Um, you know, I've, I've joined the, the uh, I guess, the ownership group of the, the Bisbon Bullets recently. So, you know, when, right. when, yeah, so when, so when our teams play against each other, man, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta do a wager or something where I gotta talk some trash right. to you or something. <laughs> okay, congrats, congrass. Thank, awesome. thank you, thank you, thank you. Just, just, just recently, just recently, just yeah. recently happened. So cool. appreciate it, man, appreciate it. But just, so just talk about that. I mean, just the, the opportunity to, you know, to be an owner and, 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 and why you chose, you know, the, the MBL and, and, and to be, um, you know, in Australia. Yeah. So, um, Australian league from when I first went over there to now has grown exponentially. Um, the league has gotten more professional. Uh, Larry Kesselman came in and bought the league. Yeah. Um, and it's done an amazing job. Great job. job the so, um, you know, with that, I think, you know, the, the ownership component, you know, is kind of broken up into two things for me. Uh, number one, uh, it's, it's just spending 15 years playing, uh, you know, for teams and dealing with that, like it, it's just a, a a really cool, I guess, honor and privilege to now be a part mm -hmm. of the ownership group, mm -hmm. you know, and try to create a culture and a vision and, you know, something successful on the other side of it, right? So that's one one component. And two, um, you know, having a chance to go out and spend some time in Australia, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on a yearly basis for me is also you know, a big deal. And, and uh, you know, I have some lifelong friends there that I love to kind of continue to see and, and all that. So um, the combination of that, in addition to it, I think being a good investment yeah. uh, is is why I, I, I ended up doing the deal. Um, you know, the the league has done what it's done now without a major TV deal. Um, yeah. You know, and had success with, you know, uh, uh, Terrence Ferguson, LaMelo, uh, RJ Hampton, you know, um, this kid, Jay Sean Tate, who just came out, Tory Craig, you know, and you're seeing more and more guys, you know, transition from the NBL to the NBA. Uh, and I think that, you know, now you got the NBA reacting to that, right? They got this G League team that they want to create to kind of keep kids here. But, you know, more and more guys are going to continue to make that transition to the, to the NBA, out of the NBL, uh, which I think is going to continue to help help grow the league. I agree. I mean, I think it's uh, it's – the, the league has definitely, I've been following the league for a while now. And I think like the potential and the growth factor of the league is, is incredible. Um, and for them to be able, you said they haven't been to do what they've done without a major TV deal and only have, you know, eight or nine teams in the league currently, um, if they're able to, you know, continue this on this rate. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's has a lot of, like I said, it has a lot of, a lot of great opportunities. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Now I want to get into um, what the the main topic of of our of our conversation of our podcast is today, and that is you know athletes um, getting involved in real estate, um, real estate investment, real estate in, uh, development. Um, you know, as we've seen, I think you know recently, um, which has always kind of been, um, but I think it was more passively in the past. Um, athletes have you know taken a more active role um, in real estate real estate developing, whether or not it's buying whole, whether or not it's flipping or wholesaling, or like you're doing, you know, large scale development deals. So I wanted to talk to you more about it because you have experience um, and you're somebody, you know, that has recently um, retired and, you know, you've kind of, you know, dive right in and you've had tremendous success. Um, so first off, I want to talk, why real estate? You know, what was it about real estate that, you know, was the I guess the asset class that you chose to, you know, spend your time in and, and, and invest, um, you know, majority of, I guess you can say your finances, but also your time and, you know, and, and why'd you choose real estate as your, the second part of your, you know, of your, of your career? Yeah. So real estate for me, you know, going way back to like my, my great grandparents, mm -hmm. um, you know, they were landowners in the South mm -hmm. and that wasn't normal. Right. And so, I saw the power of what real estate did to then provide for my grandparents and then my mom and, uh, you know, and the family in general. And that was all done through, 
through real estate. And so fast forward to college, you know, my scholarship donor at Stanford was, uh, is a, a real estate tycoon. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I saw the power of that too, right? You took, you know, you took me and probably another hundred plus people um, who may not have been able to afford a Stanford education, put us through school, through real estate. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, as I played, I, I invested in and dabbled in a bunch of different, uh, you know, sectors, uh, venture capital, private equity, uh, you know, and the like. And I just always kind of came back to real estate somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my last year, kind of when I thought I was going to retire, but um, 2018, I ended up uh, buying a commercial property here in, in, in Southern California. And um, that was like my first story into larger scale properties. I'd invested as an LP in a number of deals before that, but um, that this was like mine. And, uh, you know, the cash flows, the tax benefits, you know, um, you know, all of those things. And, and quite frankly, like not having to manage it day to day yeah. uh, was appealing. And so um, that kind of in conjunction with just it, it being a tangible asset uh, that I can go, I can go walk my property. I can go, yeah. you know, take, I can go walk the property with my daughter and say, hey, this is yours in the future. That's tangible, you know, and, and it's not something that, um, you know, I have to, it's not like a, just an investment that I made that isn't doing anything, um, you know, I have no control over. So, um, you know, all those, those things in combination is why I, I chose the real estate space. Now, why would you, recommend or why would you suggest athletes to to become real estate investors um to me i think the 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 biggest positive that you already named you know some of the tax incentives and cash flow and possibilities for generational wealth but i think to me why many athletes kind of gear towards real estate is the whole tangible assets it's a tangible thing like you said it's not like stocks it's not like you know other investments but you know to you in your opinion um if somebody has experience you know why would you tell athletes or an athlete to you know to invest or start investing in real estate well, i think there's a number of reasons uh one being um you know real estate has created more millionaires in this country than i think any other space absolutely uh, so that, that's the, the the financial component of it uh, you know as you are spending so much time honing your craft, you mm -hmm. know, and, and being active in, in your current profession that pays the bills, uh, having something that you don't have to actively manage is uh, a benefit. Uh, you know, I mean, you mentioned the tax, the tax benefits. Uh, and I just think that like, it's something that you can grow over time and you can, you can start incrementally. Um, you can, you know, purchase a, uh, a single family residence in the town that you live in and, you know, buy one every year that you play, you play yeah. 10, 15 years, you've got 10, 15 properties that are cash flowing, you know, a thousand to, to, you know, $2,000 a month. And, you know, that's something that you can set up, you know, and kind of keep for the long haul. And I think as athletes, we, uh, you know, you know, money, go, money comes, money goes, you know, you got so many other things that you're doing, you're trying to manage, you know, making sure that you, you, you're on top of your game, having something that you can kind of passively, you know, create a, a portfolio around um, and provide long-term stability for you and your family is, is powerful for me. So all those things kind of combined is why I think athletes should, athletes should take a look into real estate. Um, in addition to, like I said, the tax component is a major one. I thought when, and I, I seen it on your Instagram, when you said, you know, the, the whole thing about buying, you know, one property a year for every year that you played, I think that was a, a, a super simplified strategy that it's something that every athlete or I mean, every athlete, but every person is something that, that they can maintain. So um, I think that's, that's, that's awesome advice. Now I have a question about, you know, one of the things that most athletes, you know, because especially overseas guys, um, you know, we're away from, you know, our, our home or away from, you know, our local community, you know, for a long period of time. Um, and a lot of guys feel like they don't have the opportunity to, you know, um, you know, manage or afraid to get in real estate. You know, what, what are some ways that you, like you said, you got your start in 2018, but what were you doing up to that point to kind of educate yourself? So that way, you know, about real estate. So that way, when you were finished and when you were, you know, able to, you know, start buying properties, um, how did you prepare yourself, you know, up to that time while you were still playing? Uh, YouTube university. 
I got a I got a PhD in YouTube University. <laughs> <laughs> you got a ton of time, a ton of downtime. You're on the road. Um, you know, you can spend an hour a day, you know, checking out, uh, you know, buy strategies or or how to, um, you know, how to acquire properties. You know, for little to no money down. Um, you know, you spend a fair amount of time away. And, you know, so you can go out and and you know buy a place rent it out for you know nine months out of the year or, or whatever you know you're only really home a couple months you yeah. know if you're playing on, on on a good euro league or a good european team um and and yeah man you can get into properties at a low price point so that's that's the one thing that i do like about it mm-hmm. not all guys but a lot of guys come from from uh, you know humble beginnings and in inner cities and and you know you can go buy properties in in detroit for Twenty thousand yeah. dollars. You know, you can buy some properties in in some of these cities for for, for a little to nothing, relative to you know, some of the contracts that guys are getting. So, um, you know, spend time learning about it. Uh, you know, maybe reach out to some local brokers, join some real estate investment groups um, in your local area, and yeah, I mean, the, the, truly, like, you know, buying one a year. I remember when my my daughter was born. Um, you know, I, I bought a property in Memphis as like a, a college fund for her, mm-hmm. right? And, and it was, you know, much cheaper than buying a house in California, but, you know, now she has something that's gonna grow over 18 years mm-hmm. uh, from an equity perspective, but also that's, you know, depositing money into a bank account for her for the long haul. And that's something that's passive, uh, you know, that I, I don't really have to manage too much. Uh, and, you know, it's a way to just, to just grow, um, you know, grow your net worth and your portfolio uh, in a simple manner. So I, I highly encourage more and more athletes to get involved uh, because not only on the investment side, but, you know, being probably some of the more um, well-respected and famous people from the areas that we came from, you can leverage that into um, opportunities with your local cities uh, to, to do deals and, and, and work with them, um, you know, in any capacity. I'm doing that right now on account of, right? I'm, I'm yeah. doing a um, uh, 75 unit development there, uh, you know, based on just my time in the city and, and wanting to see, you know, affordable housing come to the city. So, yeah. So, I mean, that was kind of my next question. Um, but before we get to that, I wanted to ask you, you know, cause a lot of, a lot of time athletes are afraid of the, the fear of getting started. So can you talk about, you know, when, when you bought your first property and, you know, what made you kind of like, you know, just, I guess almost like I say is press the button, just press the button and kind of, you know, just kind of go at it. Um, and now you know, let's talk about, you know, moving into now the second question is how many units, um, you know, do you currently have right now? Um, and so those, those first two questions. Yeah. So uh, yeah, about my first, first property when I got mm-hmm. drafted, I bought, you know, a house when I was in Atlanta, I bought my mom a house, uh, you know, so that was my first step into real estate. Uh, I held those for a long period of time. Uh, you know, the, the, the Atlanta market got hot again. I was able to sell those, um, you know, and, and, and make some cash there. Uh, then my first kind of project I did, I, I did a flip project here in, in uh, Long Beach. Um, was able to pick up a uh, property from a wholesaler, um, you know, for 300K. I put, you know, some dollars into it. Uh, myself and actually a former, um, another former basketball player, uh, mm-hmm. Jamal Sampson, you know, we were able to be successful in that endeavor. Uh, we made some, some dollars on that. Uh, and then I started to understand the inefficiency in trying to do, you know, flip, fix and flips if you don't yeah. have a, a kind of full scale uh, operation doing so. Uh, you know, and so those dollars were tied up for, you know, six to nine months. And, you know, it was with the hope of selling and making a profit, uh, you know, so if you don't have a system where you're doing, you know, three to five to seven to 10 of those a year, it really makes it hard to create a sustainable business. Um, and that's when I then stepped into the larger commercial properties. And so I bought a 12 tenant center uh, here in Orange County, and that was my first larger purchase. Um, and uh, that acquisition has been, been great for me uh, so far. Um, you know, COVID has, has created a little bit of a bumpy path, but we've been able to uh-huh. navigate that and figure that out. And then, you know, I got with my former college teammate and roommate, Justin Davis, mm-hmm. and we were like, all right, there's going to be a lot of investment that's going to go they're going to these inner cities through opportunity zones. We need to do something about that because we are representative of the community. 
we got to make sure that we come in there and, and actually make sure that these investments are impacting the community in a positive way and not just making somebody else richer. Mm-hmm. So that's what we started the Landspire Group. And, uh, you know, and, and now we have um, a little under 400 units in the pipeline for development. Congratulations. Uh, and, Congrats. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then we were part of the acquisition of a 500 unit hotel here in Newport Beach. Uh, and um, I'm invested as an LP in a number of, of other properties across the country. So, um, you know, I, I don't, I haven't actually done a tally on how many units I'm involved in, but. Uh, that's a, that's a good problem to have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to grow the right way, man. And, and yeah. Find the people. And, and so, you know, this, this process for me has been a, a, a heck of a learning experience, but, you know, I'm happy that I'm going through it with people that I trust and that I know. Now, now many athletes, you know, we get presented with deals, whether or not they're good or bad, um, all the mm-hmm. time. So how, how have you gone about in your career, especially real estate deals? I know that all the time there's, you know, guys that you get prevented, presented with, you know, development deals or, you know, their friends wants to do this flip or, you know, that type of stuff. So, you know, how were, how have you been, you know, vetting deals, um, you know, over the course you know, of your experience as a player and then what advice would you give, you know, to, to other athletes or, you know, other players specifically, you know, about betting deals and, and, and trying to make sure that they, they find the best deal for them in their investment strategy. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of that comes from figuring out, you know, what you want out of the deal, Mm -hmm. you know, is it an equity play, you know, where you're trying to, you know, force appreciation, is it, a cash flow play where you just want to get some some cash coming in monthly, whatever your needs are for that investment. Um, you know, I think that's the first thing. Secondly, from for vetting um, deals, it's hard. Yeah, I mean, just point blank. Like everybody has a deal, and everybody wants to sell you on a deal. Uh, and what I would do is, I would essentially just suggest um, either, uh, you know, hiring somebody to to help you vet the deals. Uh, or working with your financial manager to kind of help you on that front as well. Um, you know, I've experienced it on both sides now where I, you know, as an athlete was pitched, you know, deal after deal. And now as an investor, um, you know, I'm, I'm pitching guys deals. Mm-hmm. And so I know the difficulty in, you know, can I trust this guy? Is this a good deal? You know, is this going to be, you know, a, a uh, a two X or three X, uh, uh, you know, am I going to lose money? What's, what's this look like? Um, you know, so it's, it's really difficult to navigate the space. Um, you know, so education is key, but, um, you know, really getting, getting with people you trust. I mean, I, I've, I've talked to a number of other, um, you know, basketball players about, um, opportunities that they'll show me say, Hey, do you think this is a good deal? Um, I give them my honest feedback and, um, you know, I'm open to doing that with more guys. It's just a matter of, you know, getting an understanding of how serious they are about the investment space before, you know, I spend my time and yeah. and, and some waste of time as well. Now, now, now in the second part of your career, um, I think sometimes a lot of athletes are afraid because they don't necessarily aren't comfortable in these rooms, aren't comfortable, you know, with speaking with, you know, a lot of these, you know, big name developers and stuff like that. Have you found that, um, during your time, have you found that there has been any pushback because you're an athlete or because, you know, people only feel that, you know, that you're only, you know, in this or only part of these deals because of your name and not necessarily because of, you know, other value that you can contribute? Have you experienced anything? And, and how do you, as an athlete, kind of navigate those waters to kind of put it where you can kind of show people that, you know, and I'm really like, this is really what I'm really trying to do. It's not just, you know, a money play or not just because, I'm you know, I'm Josh Childress or whoever. Right. Right. I experience it all the time. Yeah. I mean, people see athlete first. Now, fortunately, you know, having gone to Stanford, that also is part of my package. Right. And so yeah. people see that and there isn't always the, the same sort of uh, assumption that here's just this, you know, athlete who doesn't know what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I say all that to say it's something that you'll deal with for the rest of your life until you are a true professional in this other field. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, I experience that on a daily basis. Um, I get meetings because of my background and then it's on me to actually show up and present and, you know, make sure that they understand that I'm, I'm more than what you saw, you know, uh, getting a tip in, in your league. Like, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a, 
an investor and, and I'm taking it seriously. And um, you need to understand that and appreciate that and, you know, take me seriously as well. So it's all about your presentation. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm punctual. I make sure, you know, I'm prepared and um, you know, all those things, just like you would in a, in a basketball game, you, you know, you, you, um, you know, you watch film, you, you know, you uh, go through shoot around, you get your pregame nap, you, you know, mm -hmm. all those things, it's, it's the same qualities, you know, that I'm taking into these meetings, the discipline, the, the, the work ethic preparation um, that I'm, I'm taking into this space as well. So, you know, making sure that you marry the two uh, and, and are, you're, you're serious because if you are, people will take you seriously. Now, how often are, you know, when, when you were in the locker room and you were playing, how often are other athletes or other players having these type of conversations about, you know, their investments, their, their, their real estate deals, or, you know, what they're interested in off the court, um, you know, when it comes to entrepreneurship or, or anything type of business? Because I know that I'm noticing more and more, um, I feel like when I first came in, that these conversations were something that were almost taboo, like there was something that never happened. But now, um, recently, over the past two, three, four years, I'm re knowing that younger guys or even guys in general are talking about, you know, what they're on or what they're invested in. So how have you seen that in during your course of your career? Like I said, are these conversations or these topics that are something that are coming up, you know, amongst, you know, the, the players that you play with or during your time? Yeah. So the, a big, comp a big component of this is guys have access to more things than they had access to before. Yeah. Right. So with, with social media, with, you know, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, you know, all these platforms, you know, I can get to a CEO of a company or, um, you know, somebody that can get to me a lot easier than before. So the access is, is grown, has grown exponentially. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, back when I came into the league, uh, you know, it was more impressive or guys were competing more about, your car, your chain, your watch, you know, these sorts of material things. Yeah. And I think that shifted now to, you know, what tech company are you in? What yeah. are you invested? Yeah. What, you know, how many exits have you had? Like, yeah. And so the mentality has shifted. And I think with that, now the conversations have shifted where guys are much more open and, and uh, apt to talk about what they're investing in, what they're looking at uh, versus before. It's just, it's a different mentality you know, the newer generation has a much more open mindset towards it. And, you know, what was cool at one point isn't necessarily as cool uh, now. Now, what are your, and I only have a few more questions left, but what are your goals, you know, for the Land Spire group? Um, you know, where would you like to see it? Um, you know, you've, you've really, I think you guys started it two years ago, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. um, so where would you like to see it, you know, you know, 10 years from now, um, you know? Yeah. Uh, I would love to see Landspire Group as a uh, a firm in this country that uh, is obviously minority led, minority owned, mm -hmm. and you know uh, is able to hire people from inner cities and you know just more people that look like us in the real estate space. I think that that's important. It's a it's definitely a need in in commercial real estate as it's a um, an industry that's uh, not representative of the, I think, the community at large. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to have a portfolio of, uh, you know, upwards of seven to, to eight thousand units, um, you know, and, and pushing, um, you know, over a billion dollars in in, in value. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, I'd like to to create a, a program where we can um, provide scholarships to more and more kids. Um, at the local level and also at universities and, you know, really just like be a catalyst for change in, in inner cities. Right. And so, uh, you know, being a kind of the, the go-to group for athletes, but also, um, you know, for, for other, other capital to come in and invest successfully so that we can provide a platform for guys to, to, you know, um, you know, make money outside of, of their nine to five. Yeah, I man, I think it's, and I mentioned before, I mean, you're, you've been a pioneer, you know, for all of us younger athletes, as far as, you know, with overseas basketball and just your, your career and showing that you can have success on the court. But I think even now, which is even more important that you've been a, a pioneer um, as far as this real estate game, you know, the mm -hmm. things that you're doing, the development deals that you're doing and how much success that you have had and how you have the ability to scale up, um, you know, at, at, uh, and in such a short amount of time, um, I think, like you said, is, is definitely a, a motivating factor, 
you know, for many of us, like I have, you know, conversations about with one of my guys, Malcolm Delaney, about you, you know, all the time about different things that you do and different real estate things. So um, I just want to say, um, I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you, like you said, you know, even more what you've done on the court, but, you know, even more what you're doing off the court, you know, that you continue to to share and continue to provide content and provide motivation for, you know, for all of us out there. Um, so my last three questions um, are, you know, what advice would you give to an overseas basketball player or a basketball player or an athlete in general that wants to get his start in real estate? They want to know, you know, where, where do I start? You know, like you said, you have a whole bunch of stuff on YouTube. There's books, you know, everybody is a, a real estate guru on Instagram. So, you know, for you, what advice would you give them to, you know, to, to have their start? Um, first, write down a list of goals mm -hmm. that you want to have with, with real estate. Is it to buy your first house? Is it to buy a portfolio of houses? Is it to buy an apartment building? Is it to build a community center? What, what's your goal? So write down a list of three goals. And then I would, I would go to a website called Bigger Pockets, oh. uh, which is I live a, by a Bigger great, Pockets. I live yeah, by a great pockets. resource yeah. um, for starting, for individuals starting in the space. Um, you know, I used to suggest reading um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, but he kind of came out and said some, some crazy stuff on a racial space. So I, yeah. I don't necessarily like uh, funnel people there anymore, but mm -hmm. it still is a great tool to, to shift your mentality towards mm -hmm. investing. Uh, and um, I mean, yeah, then when you're home, do a deal. Yeah. You know, I think people have analysis paralysis and they, they go and they want to, you know, analyze stuff for, you know, years and years and years, do some research, find a reputable broker in your area. Um, you know, I would shy away from, from dealing with, um, you know, family members that don't know what they're doing because mm -hmm. uh, that's really a recipe for disaster. So find a broker, find a realtor uh, that you trust uh, and that you build a rapport with, have them show you some options, um, you know, in the rental space and, you know, and do a deal. Don't do a large deal, but, you know, do one to get your feet wet uh, that, you know, you know, can get rented out, uh, you know, while you're gone. And, and that would be how I would start. Last two questions, um, and it's kind of kind of similar, but you know, what advice would you give to a young basketball player that is looking to become, you know, not only successful in basketball but successful in life? Like I said, you've you've been well traveled, you know, you've had plenty of success on the court. Um, so, what would you, what advice would you give to a young basketball player um, that wants to have a, you know, a longevity, a long-standing pro career like you have had? Uh, first thing I would say is reach out to an older player, uh, a guy that's big. that, that that's big. you know, you, you look up to trust, you've heard good things about, um, you know, it's something that I wish I would have done earlier in my career, mm -hmm. um, that I didn't, uh, but you know, we, we've gone through a lot and we've navigated spaces that, uh, you know, a lot of other kids, um, shouldn't have to navigate. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we can help them in that regard. I think that it's it's uh, really a beneficial thing for both sides. So reach out to a player that you think can help you, um, you know, that's like-minded, that's from your area. I guarantee you most of the guys will gladly help you. Um, so that's number one. Uh, number two is, you know, dedicate yourself to being the best version of yourself. Mm -hmm. So a, a large portion, portion of that is personal development. Um, you know, you should be trying to read a, a book uh, a month uh, on, you know, a wide range of topics outside of, of basketball, right? Get out of your comfort zone, read, you know, something on mindset, read, you know, one of Phil Jackson's books, read, um, shoe dog, wh whatever it mm -hmm. is, but, you know, something to, to, to kind of get you, um, you know, more seasoned and more, uh, exposed to, uh, areas outside of what you're predominantly focused in. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, I, I mentioned this in a couple other things is just write down a list of goals. Yeah, uh, I think that that's one of the powerful things to do because it forces you to think about what you want to accomplish, and um, and then you have a clearer pathway to doing that if you know if you know what you want to what you want to accomplish. Uh, I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. Um, and my last question is the question I kind of put everybody on the spot with um, to try to transition back to basketball. Um, talking specifically about your league, um, like you said, you played there two years. Who was a player that you played against or played with? that surprised you? Um, like I said, you played with some, you know, great players, whether it was Big Sofu or Tia Dosich or 
um, Papa Lucas, and you played mm -hmm. against a lot of great players in that era. So what was a player that you that you had no idea about or somebody that surprised you that you played against, um, you know, during that time? It had to be Milos. Yeah. So, oh, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, the dude is just <laughs> – Yeah. Is, you know, his abilities uh, were just incredible to me. Because, yeah. you know, I think – you know, you look at what he's done, you know, he's had success, obviously, but he's a guy that, I mean, it's just his passing ability was was unbelievable, um, you know, and, and, you know, you have these guys that, like, are successful because they don't care. Yeah. You know, they don't care about making mistakes. They don't care. That was him, yeah. you know, and, and you know, you're, you have these other guys who overthink everything, want everything to be perfect. And, um, you know, I just, I really enjoyed watching him, uh, you know, as a, as a teammate, as a player, as a fan. Uh, I think he, he he plays at a high level. Um, so him and then, uh, you know, um, uh, Spanoulis as well. Mm -hmm. I think that what he's been able to do over his career is is incredible. Um, you know, I saw him early when he was in the league, you know, mm -hmm. when that didn't go, go well. Uh, but, you know, his his transition back to Europe and, like, you know, his, his dominance in, in Europe has been incredible. So... Those were the two. I mean, there's so many that, that I could name yeah. that, you know, I, I'd never heard of or um, hadn't seen play that, that you know, were, were really great players. Uh, but, you know, those are the two that come to mind first. And the last question, I'm, I'm not sure how much current Euro League basketball you get opportunity to watch, but who is your, you know, the favorite, your favorite player to watch currently or, um, you know, in Euro League basketball right now? Shoot. Uh, Mike James? Mike, my guy, yeah. <laughs> That dude is a monster. Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable, man. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, uh, you know, I mean, he's, he has a total package offensively. Um, and I haven't watched a ton of games. I see yeah. a lot of the highlight stuff on Switch Cultures. But, I mean, his finger rolls from the free throw line, you know, floaters <laughs> both, all over both the place. hands. <laughs> Step back. I mean, it's just, you know, the, the offensive package is elite. So, I would say he's one of my favorites to watch. All right, man. Well, I appreciate it. I know you you, you, you you got a busy schedule and you're doing a lot, um, you know, being the CEO of your own company. But I just want to say, man, I appreciate you taking the time, you know, uh, you know, for the on on this on this uh, content and on this on this format of, uh, you know, letting us all know about your experiences, both on and off the on and off the basketball court. Um, and thank yeah. you so much. And like I said, man, when uh, when our teams match up in in the NBL, man, we gotta we gotta wager something, push ups or or, or something, something. For sure, I, I I can't beat you in a push up game, dog. We can be <laughs> <laughs> got too many muscles for you, uh, you know, I want to I want to commend you, man, on a, on an amazing career you you've done uh, you. a heck of a job, and um, you know I admire, you know, you've been able to play at this high level for so long. Um, so keep doing what you're doing, man. Thank and, you. I appreciate keep being it. For a lot of the, the, the younger generation and the, the guys in Europe, um, because they need it. They need the representation. So um, kudos to you, man. Um, proud of what you're doing, what you're accomplishing. Just keep going, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate it a lot, man.